This stadium right behind me is one of the biggest in Finland, but if you look a little closer, it looks abandoned. There's no sponsor names visible, and honestly, the parking lots are all empty. It looks kind of like a ghost town. But up until a month ago, this place was thriving, and there were concerts scheduled this entire summer. Not only that, but the World Ice Hockey Championships were scheduled to be hosted right here. So how come this stadium looks so abandoned in just the span of a month? This is the story of how Putin and his cronies stole Helsinki and Jokerit, Finland's biggest hockey team. Ice hockey is Finland's most popular sport. The puck slapping, the head smashing, the torella tavataning. It's pretty clear that Finland loves ice hockey. Lots of Finns play in the NHL, and Finland's domestic league, Liiga, is considered one of the best in the world. And in Finland's capital, Helsinki, ice hockey is just as big as you'd imagine it would be. And one of Helsinki's most recognizable faces is this winking joker, the logo for Helsinki's biggest team, Helsinki Jokerit. Jokerit started out from humble beginnings in the 1970s, after a local team in Helsinki went bankrupt. The team built up and found itself playing in SM Liiga, now known as Liiga, Finland's premier professional hockey league. Future NHL stars and some of Finland's hockey heroes have made Jokerit a venerable hockey institution in Finland. Just to name a few of these names, Jari Korri, Teemu Selane, and Marko Anttila have all played for Jokerit at different points in their careers. The team has won the Canada Malia, or the Canada Bowl, Finland Stanley Cup six times, and been runners up for it another six times. Wait a second. While I was researching this video, I was like, why do they call it the Canada Bowl? So the story goes is that in 1951, the Finnish diaspora in Canada donated money for a hockey trophy in Finland. And you have to remember at this time, the Stanley Cup was pretty popular in Canada. It had been around since the 1890s. So it makes sense that Finnish people going to Canada would have seen, hey, let's make our own trophy and send it back home. So kind of a unique connection between countries in that way. Anyway, that's the story behind the nomenclature of the Canada Malia or Canada Bowl. Let's get back to the main story. Enough dilly-dallying. God. God. Well, Jokeri isn't the most successful team in Finland, the team was one of the most prominent and highest performing in Finland, mostly due to their star power and playing in the biggest city in the country. In 2013, it was announced that Jokerit would join the Continental Hockey League, foregoing Liga, abandoning its crosstown rivalry with HIFK, and leaving lots of fans scratching their heads because the KHL is Russia's hockey league. Finland is a pretty complicated relationship with Russia. If you're watching my video, you're probably already aware of that. If you pay attention to world news even slightly, you probably are aware of this. I don't know, I'd be very surprised if my algorithm finds someone who doesn't know that Finland and Russia already have a pretty tenuous relationship at best. But honestly, if it does, that means this video is doing well. Good job. No matter how amicable the relationship between Finland and Russia gets from time to time, there's still something sinister about Finland's biggest hockey team leaving for the Russian league. I mean, even the European Super League was criticized as something sinister, and it didn't even have this backdrop of Russian oligarch money. But What's so bad about the KHL anyway? While the league isn't exactly owned by Gazprom, it's run by a lot of the same oligarchs in charge of both organizations. Additionally, many teams are outright owned by Gazprom, and the largest and most prevalent sponsor is, you guessed it, Gazprom. And if you're unaware of Gazprom, it's the Russian state-controlled gas company. The Russian government owns just over 50% of shares in Gazprom, meaning that it is directly tied into the interests of the Russian government. As a result, Gazprom is directly involved and at sometimes at the forefront of Russian diplomatic efforts and its foreign policy. And if you haven't remembered, the Russian government doesn't have the highest moral ground to stand on. Playing in the KHL is at best complicity in Russia's crimes, and at its worst, it's full-on endorsement. The KHL is, at its core, a poorly disguised attempt at Russian soft power diplomacy. What is soft power diplomacy? Well, in international relations, we generally put political power into two categories, hard and soft. Hard power is usually military or economic and in an effort to coerce a lesser state into aligning with you. Soft power is using things like diplomacy, culture, and history to coerce another state but with a lot less aggression, and it tends to be a bit more subtle. Oftentimes, the carrot and the stick metaphor is used, in which the carrot is soft power and the stick is hard power. 
Real world examples of hard power are when the US moves an aircraft carrier fleet into the Strait of Taiwan as tensions with China start to boil, or off the coast of North Korea when Kim Jong-un fires another missile. Soft power can be a little bit more nebulous, and at times it can be harder to point out. Historically, Hollywood and American music have been huge examples of soft power that have helped the US achieve its interests. A great example of emerging modern day soft power is South Korea, with its culture, especially pop culture, on display for the whole world. This will naturally gravitate a lot of other countries to align with South Korea on certain issues. In fact, one could say that South Korea is a modern day textbook example on how to effectively use and develop soft power. While its northern neighbor does a pretty poor job in the soft power department because there isn't a lot for outsiders to admire about such a repressive culture. But that sure doesn't stop them from trying. Look at these North Korean restaurants, supposed cultural embassies of Kim Jong-un's regime scattered across the world to promote North Korean culture. So we could consider the KHL to be a direct extension of Russian soft power, state-sponsored soft power, given the fact that it is supported, funded, and at times teams are even owned by Gazprom. And not only that, but this is Putin's personal pet project. KHL expansion has been a priority under Russia. In 2021, the league played in six different countries, Russia, Finland, Latvia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, and China. And honestly, the KHL is kind of similar to those North Korean restaurants, a thinly veiled attempt by an authoritarian regime to promote its own culture. But the biggest thing to remember about soft power is it's most effective when done by a culture that other people in the world want to emulate. So those tend to be liberal democracies in some form or fashion, whether it's the US, South Korea, or honestly, even Finland at times. Being able to export soft power is most successful by countries like this. Sure, there are exceptions from time to time, but generally speaking, this is the rule for soft power. Make no mistake about it. The KHL is an extension of the Russian government by proxy through Gazprom. Not only that, but it's a classic example of sports washing. Sports washing is a term that encapsulates Gazprom's activities pretty well. It's not just the KHL that Gazprom is involved in, but also the UEFA Champions League and World Cup, effectively using sports sponsorships as a means to make the brand look better. And Gazprom isn't the only organization guilty of this. Just look at the host countries for the Olympics and World Cup this year, or the sponsor on the front of your favorite European club's main jersey. Chances are there's some dirty money somewhere. So let's take a little bit of a break. I'm really excited to announce that my channel finally got our first sponsor. I know, right? This is kind of a small channel and we already have a sponsor. So without further ado, let's uh, run that ad read. Do you like it warm in the winter? I sure do. Are you from Europe? Then you're probably using this product already, even if you don't want to. That's why I go to Gazprom for all my heating and energy needs, sure. There are other options, but even nuclear power in Finland has questionable ties to oligarchs and the Russian regime. The point is, Gazprom is here, and we already have the pipelines, so who really cares? It's not that big a deal, and just don't think about it too hard. Because if you think about it too hard, you'll realize where the money's going. And at the end of the day, I mean, who wants to pay more for their heating and energy bill? I know, right? So that's why I've partnered with Gazprom to bring you a special 15% deal. Unfortunately, if you're a European government, you're gonna have to pay in rubles instead of euros. Sorry, it's just how it is right now. But anyway, if you want 15% off, use promo code SMOOTH when you go to gazprom.ru. Remember, promo code SMOOTH. When you are a European country trying to broker a new energy deal with Gazprom, use promo code SMOOTH. Thanks again, and yeah, I know, right? We got a sponsor, how cool is that? Hey, uh, Germany, I'm talking to you. If you want a deal on your next your next energy deal, hey, use the promo code. Come on, we can, let's, let's get some of those rubles, baby. All right, so there's a couple key individuals when talking about how Jokeri moved from Liga to the KHL. Not just me because I was sponsored by Gazprom for this video. Don't, don't read too much into that. Enter one charismatic owner. Now, I'm not gonna call this guy Finland's Trump, but at one point, he may have saw himself as kind of like a Trumpelainen. I mean, the guy hosted Finland's version of The Apprentice. <laughs> so, like, you tell me. And he's now not only a politician, but he started his own political party. But he's not quite like Trump, except for some potential Russian collusion. Actually, with him, he did way more than just collude. He practically sold the team to Vladimir Putin. 
Yali's Harukimo had been the owner of Yokerit since the 90s, and in 2013, Harukimo said that Yokerit joining the KHL would be good for the fans. Competition would increase, the team would see bigger profits, and the opportunity to grow outside of Finland would be realized. At least, this is what was promised and intended. Now, Yali's Harukimo is a character, for sure, and I don't mean to badmouth him, I don't mean to compare him too much to Trump, I just find it kind of funny that the guy hosts Finland's version of The Apprentice. In fact, part of me kind of admires the guy. I don't agree with a lot of his politics, but I don't wish ill will on him. He's kind of got this charismatic persona. I mean, he's able to poke fun at himself. Here he is on Finland's version of Saturday Night Live. He even has his own YouTube channel, where he said Finland needs to join NATO, which is one of the stances of his political party as well. I, it does give me a little bit of whiplash, though, for someone to be calling for NATO accession while cozying up to some of arguably the worst oligarchs in Russia. And let's introduce them now. This brings in our next cast of characters, Finland's very own Russian oligarchs. Now, since the end of the Cold War, every country in Europe has their own flavor of Russian oligarch. I mean, the UK has Roman Abramovich, France has whatever dozen or so oligarchs want to store their super yachts on the Mediterranean. It just depends where you are. You'll get different flavors of Russian oligarchs all the time. Finland's flavor happens to be the Rotenbergs. The Rotenbergs, Boris and Arkady, have had a bit of a pension for Finland for a while now. Boris came to Helsinki as a judo instructor after the fall of the Soviet Union in the 90s. With Gennady Timchenko, another Russian oligarch, the three became part owners in Jokeri after Harkimo sold shares to them. Boris Rotenberg is a Finnish citizen, along with his son, Russia's very own hockey influencer, Roman. Additionally, Gennady Timchenko is a Finnish citizen too. These guys aren't your average oligarchs. These are Putin's creme de la creme of oligarchy. Boris Rotenberg is even Putin's judo buddy, and it makes sense given how much the guy likes hockey. The net worth of all these oligarchs, the Rotenbergs and Timchenko, is over 10 billion, and Boris Johnson referred to these three specific oligarchs as Putin's cronies and called for specific sanctions against them. These individuals that owned portions of Jokerit at one time or another aren't just your run-of-the-mill oligarchs. These guys are oligarch-flavored oligarchs. Harakimo sold off some shares of the team to these oligarchs, as well as the entirety of Jokerit's arena, formerly known as Hartwall Arena, this arena right here. For a few years, from 2014 to 2019, the team functioned with Harakimo and the oligarchs, with Yari Kori, a Finnish hockey legend and Jokerit general manager, purchasing small shares as well. After a 2019 deal in which Harkimo bought back all his shares from the oligarchs, Yari Kori became the sole owner of Jokerit. Kori is a Finnish legend in hockey. Back in the 80s, he and Gretzky were slapping pucks and nets on the same line in Edmonton. And look, I don't think there's anything wrong with him owning any shares in Jokerit. I don't think there's anything wrong with Harkimo being an owner in Jokerit either. In fact, there probably couldn't be a more fitting owner than Yari Kori in the team's history. But what I will say is that this next part's a little bit concerning. Kori sold 40% to Norilsk Nickel because the team needed financial assistance. Yes, that Norilsk Nickel. The Norilsk Nickel behind the world's most polluted city and the most miserable place on earth. And not my words, someone else's. And Norilsk Nickel, the company responsible for this environmental disaster, masquerading as a city, is owned by yet another oligarch, Vladimir Potanin. No, not Vladimir Putin, but there's another oligarch whose name is Vladimir P Potanin. Not Putin, Potanin. It can get a bit confusing. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of dirty money and dirty hands to trace in this story. Norilsk Nickel is responsible for 1.9% of all global sulfur dioxide emissions. And its site in Norilsk is the single largest point for sulfur dioxide emissions in the world. Take a look at this map of worldwide sulfur dioxide hotspots. Keep in mind that some sulfur dioxide is naturally occurring around volcanic zones. Can you guess where in the world Norilsk is based on this map? And Norilsk Nickel doesn't confine its polluting to just Russia. Norilsk Nickel subsidiary in Finland has their own environmental infractions as well. In 2014, their refinery at Harjavalta let 66 tons of nickel sulfate 
flow into a local river over the span of two days. Nickel concentrations in the river were 400 times higher than typical events, and this accident is the largest known leak of its kind in Finland. Despite cozying up to dirty money, Jokeri is financially bleeding and has been for years. Even with the promises of financial success, bigger markets, and more revenue, the team has been operating at a loss, relying on capital loans from Norilsk Nickel. I really struggle to understand what the benefit of any of this has been for Jokeri. It's hard for me to wrap my head around this. Even when Jokeri went to the Gagarin Cup playoffs, yes, that's right, in Russia, the Continental Hockey League's main trophy is called the Gagarin Cup, named after the first man in space, Yuri Gagarin. If you needed any more confirmation that this league is Russian propaganda, look no further. I don't even think Yuri Gagarin ever played hockey. Like, what? I don't even think Yuri Gagarin even touched a hockey stick in his life. So when Jokeri went to the Gagarin Cup playoffs, there were some shady things going on with the refs. And Jokeri is a good team. Don't get me wrong. They saw themselves as kind of a big fish in a small pond. But what happens when the bigger pond next door is rigged against you entirely and the referee fish don't let you get any bigger? Oh, and that same pond declares war on another pond. All right, maybe this fish analogy isn't working out. At the end of the day, none of the promises were met for Jokerit joining the KHL. Jokerit fans are pissed, and rightfully so. The team's finances are directly reliant on one of the most corrupt corporations on earth. Even by Russian standards, it's pretty bad. However, it appears that the last straw finally broke the camel's back. Despite Jokeri joining the KHL in the midst of the Crimean annexation, the full-scale invasion in 2022 was finally the last thing to take Jokeri out of Putin's hockey project. And even then, the Finnish sponsor Hartwall and Jokeri's third-party contractor Barona both dipped out before Jokeri officially left the KHL. To be fair though, in 2020, Jokerit fans protested during the Belarus unrest after Lukashenko's rigged election. Fans were against the team playing against Dinamo Minsk, threatening to boycott home games, so the team didn't show up to Belarus. In response, the KHL treated this as a forfeit and handed Jokerit a 5-0 loss. I honestly don't know how Jokerit moves forward. This is tough to recover from. There have been some efforts for Jokerit to play in Liga again, but let's see if that happens next season. I mean, if I was Liga, I wouldn't welcome them with open arms after they just left. The head coach and many of the players have already left Jokeri, and the future looks very unclear for this hockey club. This whole KHL fiasco will be viewed as a blunder for years to come. There's simply no way to sugarcoat it. Okay, so this is future Matt, or more likely to you still past Matt, but it's closer to your present. Let's put it that way. This is close to your present. I recorded the main dialogue about like, I don't know, almost a month ago. Sorry, it's taken me a while to edit these things. I wanna do a good job and I wanna give you the highest quality product possible. I feel like there's a lack of content like this about Finland in English. And if you agree, like, subscribe, comment, share, do whatever you can. I wanna make as many of these videos as possible. And again, like I'm not asking for money. I just like to do these for fun. So the biggest developments in the story have been that Norilsk Nickel no longer owns any share in Jokerit. They sold their remaining 40% to Yari Kori, who is now the sole owner of the team. Additionally, the Rotenbergs and Timchenko still own the former Hartwall Arena. Now Helsinki, Helsinki Holly, I guess? Anyway, that's irrelevant. I'll just call it former Hartwall Arena, easier for us to understand. The Finnish national authorities seized Gennady Timchenko's stake in the holding company for the former Hartwall Arena. What this means is that any transactions are going to be a little bit tougher now. Gennady Zimchenko is also the first Finnish citizen to be under such strong sanctions, might I add. There's been some talk by former NHL star Teemu Selane to purchase the arena, but whether this comes to fruition is yet to be seen. We are treading into uncharted territory now. Finland's relationship with Russia has changed rapidly within the past few months, and this is kind of the nexus where this is occurring. So I just want to say thank you again for watching this video. It took me a while to make it, as you can tell. And let's get back to past Matt now. But unfortunately, it looks like I have to support a different Helsinki team, given the circumstances. So I apologize to Jokerit fans, but uh, I guess I'm going to be a, a Hoefko fan, or H-I-F-K. You know, the different alphabets in Finnish and English. So 
Thanks for watching. I really appreciate you watching this video, your continued support, and I'm hoping to get some more videos out to you soon.